Hello, I'm Paul Beck with, I've done many, many videos uh, recently on the Arctic and I promise you I will switch topics. I'm going to be talking about the jet stream and about Antarctica and about permafrost and methane and all these other fun things very, very soon. But I do have a couple more things to talk about with the Arctic. So. One of the big questions that I have discussed in previous videos is how the industrial shutdowns for the coronavirus, how they've um, reduced the aerosols in the atmosphere and therefore reduced some of the dimming effects that happen causing warming. And I estimated that the, um, I estimated the, the overall temperature rise both um, globally and uh, you know, discuss you know how it how it plays out in the in the Arctic. So this guy this guy wants to get down. He's getting a bit restless. He's starting to dig his claws in. Okay, so um, so basically, you know, one of the questions is, you know, how is the Arctic being affected by the reduction of aerosols from the uh, coronavirus uh, shutdowns, the industrial shutdowns. So less CO2 emissions, less, uh, less aerosol emissions, less sulfur dioxide, less black carbon, all of these things. So a reduction of global dimming. But how, how does it play out in the Arctic? And uh, one of the things that I think has been happening, get the cat fur out of my mouth, sorry. One of the things um, that's really been noticeable in the last number of months is the huge temperatures in uh, in Siberia in particular you know many de many days over 30 degrees celsius so i'll show you some data on that and can we say that uh this lack of aerosols is uh you know partly responsible for amplifying these temperatures in Siberia so i've been investigating the effects of anthropogenic aerosols on the Arctic, and they're projected to decline in the future um, over North America and Europe, for example, sulfur dioxide, um, SO sulfates, which are, you know, sulfur dioxide precursors, which are sulfuric acid um, aerosols. Um, you know, they block some sunlight, cause cooling. You know, that's declined in North America and Europe from uh, pollution laws, cleaning up uh, the atmosphere laws. But they're on the, they've been on the rise, of course, in, in Asia, um, in uh, China, right? So those two effects seem to have, uh, you know, as it's rising, as they're rising in developing countries, they're decreasing in developed countries. So how has that affected the sea ice in the past? And how has the reduction of these aerosols affected the 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 uh, Arctic temperatures that we've been seeing most recently? So I'm trying to look at this, and I don't have all the answers on this. Obviously, you know, there's very complex interactions going on. But I thought I'd give some videos on on some papers and some of the things that I found so far. So this is one of the key papers that I'll be talking about. So if you just Google the title. It's open source, impact of aerosol emission controls on future Arctic sea ice cover. And this is another key paper elucidating the role of anthropogenic aerosols in Arctic sea ice variation. So, th so these two papers can give us some understanding of how aerosols are affecting the Arctic sea ice cover. And then let, you know, let us make some educated guesses as to how the reduction of aerosols from the coronavirus um, caused industrial shutdowns is possibly contributing to these huge Siberian temperatures. So, you know, as you know, I've done lots of sea ice videos in the last little while, you know, trying to look at, you know, after the first blue ocean event, what happens next to the sea ice. So I highly encourage you to, you know, have a look at some of these recent videos. Um, and, uh, a friend of mine, Matthew, sent out this um, image. And this is the, so this is basically the Western Siberian surface air temperature anomalies.
for May. Okay, this is a, the gist temp record, 1880 to, to 2019. Um, you can see all the data. And what you can see here is this is in May in Western Siberia and the temperature anomaly for the entire month of May, about five degrees Celsius warmer than normal. I mean, look at this, look at this spike, you know, what's going on this year. Um, this is the surface temperature, air temperature anomalies for December through May. And basically you can see, you know, that we're, we're you know, over five degrees Celsius. So it's not just in May, it's in December through May. Okay, uh, huge air, huge spikes in, in air temperatures in Western Siberia. So what's the, what's causing that? Okay, it, it's insane, as Matthew said. This is Matthew Ladd, a good, a good friend of mine. Okay, so, you know, on Twitter, um, you know, of course, I tweet out all of the, the videos and the blog from paulbeckwith.net. So please make sure you, you go there if you haven't seen my blog. And, uh, you know, a couple of interesting things, you know, I may discuss in videos, extreme waves set to get bigger. Um, but here, we're in a climate emergency. So NASA and NOAA just confirmed that May 2020 was the warmest May on record globally. And here's the, so this is May 2020. This is the temperature anomaly relative to just 1951 to 1980. So globally, 1.02 Celsius higher in May 2020 relative to all of the other Mays uh, with the baseline 1951 to 1980. Add about 0.3 to get to the baseline of 1880 to 1910. Add another 0.3 to get to the 1750 baseline. So we're about 1.62 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. But look here at the, at the Asia, the Siberia temperature anomalies, between four and 7.5 degrees. As I just pointed out there, you know, it's, it's over five degrees, five and a half degrees um, warmer, um, you know, is the temperature anomaly over this whole region. So, you know, there's obviously very strong, a um, lot of very strong ridges here, uh, probably a fixed or stuck pattern, bringing up warm, humid air from far, from far south. So what's going on there? And can we relate this to aerosol reductions I I over China, for example, from the, the, the coronavirus? Okay, um, and if we go to so this is the, if we go to another plot, um, this is from the NOAA. This is land and ocean temperature departure from average, May 2020. And again, you can see that this agrees, you know, huge warming. It agrees with the previous image. Okay, you know, the huge warming up in this region here. Um, go back and have a look at, at a, some other tweets. Um, this is Eric Coltis again. Um, and we've got a couple diff there's different data sets. This is Berkeley Earth. This is the temperature anomaly, you know, depicted from them. And again, you can see this entire region here with huge temperature anomalies. This is from January to May, 2020. Okay, and if you look at the plot here, this is global annual average with 95% confidence interval. Okay, this is January to May 2020, right up here. And the, their estimated likely range for the 2020 final average in this range here, very good chance that it'll set a record by far, you know. Um, and uh, this is relative to the 1951 to 1980 average. And, you know, we're already, you know, this is like one point, well, 1 1.06 degrees or whatever. Um, so huge uh, anomalies. Okay. And of course, if climate change was a chicken, I put this out. Here's this huge chicken, you know, sort of looking, you know, eat, having some food on the beach. Um, and uh, yes, here's an interesting jet stream review from Carbon Brief, and I'll probably talk about that 
I say, decent Jetstream article worth of videos soon. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, if you look at Earth Null School, remember this is a good way to look at real-time temperatures. You can go up into the Arctic, just look at the surface temperatures. Anything green is above zero. So, you know, you can scan through the different days and you can see lots of green appearing up in the Arctic. And this is, uh, you know, leading to very, very rapid uh, melt conditions. And if I go to the forums, if I go to the forum, this is, I'm looking at... Uh, Arctic sea ice graphs, uh, you know, Arctic sea ice forum, and uh, the 2020 melting season, having a look at that. And you can see things that are happening. Um, you know, lots of people are looking at this, like last month's temperature at 925 hexapascal. This is about a kilometer off the surface, as it was the warmest May on record within the Arctic Circle. And uh, you know, the projections for um, the next week or two, of course, when the sun is very, very strong in the Arctic, is for very, very clear skies. Okay, very, very clear skies, uh, very few clouds. So therefore, um, we can expect, so sol solstice, June 21st, uh, lots of clear sky and insulation projected, 33% of the entire Arctic roughly, 42 hours later, 60% of the Arctic open. So we're going to, you know, the sun's at the, at the peak and we're going to get lots of warming and lots of melt. So people are suspecting, you know, that if this trend continues, we'll, we, we, we were gonna, we're, we'll give 2012 a, a run for its money. That was the previous year when we had minimum sea ice in September. Okay, so there's lots of details on these forums. This is a different forum on, you know, they're talking about sea ice area and extent data and, uh, you know, where we are on the, the curves coming down. Like this is the Japanese JAXA Arctic sea ice extent data in square kilometers near record low areas a little bit higher. Okay, uh, but the sea ice is melting very strongly and of course why not with those huge temperatures up in the Arctic. So let's have a look at this paper here and this paper here and that can maybe give us some insight into the effect of aerosols on Arctic sea ice cover, what's projected in the future and of course when you throw in the data from the uh, industrial shutdowns you know, reducing aerosols, about reducing emissions and therefore reducing aerosols about 17% or so globally on a daily basis uh, for many, many days in, you know, from March to April to May. Mostly it was reductions in China and then it spread to Europe and North America. So reductions in emissions, greenhouse gases, also reductions in aerosols. So we can get an idea for how aerosols affect the Arctic sea ice cover from this paper. So again, and, and this is, a, this is a, you know, have a look at it. It's Canadian Centre for Climate Modelling and Analysis. They examine the response of Arctic sea ice to projected aerosol and aerosol precursor emission changes. Um, and the overall decrease in aerosol loading causes a warming, which is largest over the Arctic, which leads to an annual mean reduction in sea ice extent of roughly 1 million square kilometers over the 21st century in all RCP scenarios. So it has a definite impact in the Arctic. The decrease of aerosols, of course, happened very, very rapidly because of the coronavirus. So that's, according to this, it has a definite effect in the, in the Arctic, a definite warming effect in the Arctic. And, uh, you know, it's hard to say exactly how much of that warming that we've been seeing is from the decrease of aerosol loading, but we would expect a warming for sure. They said this accounts for about 25% of the simulated reduction in sea ice extent in the RCP 4.5 scenario, 40% reduction in the lower emission scenario. And for example, in RCP 4.5, the models showed that it would be ice free during summertime in 2045 with the reductions of aerosol, but if the aerosols were held fixed at the 2000 values, 
it would take till 2057. I'll continue in a second video. Thanks for listening.